Welcome to Alchemical Science. I'm Jordan, an open source researcher. I'm quite excited to show you what I've found in this video. I believe this is perhaps the simplest way possible to begin to learn the form of ancient mathematics that we can variously call vortex-based maths, Sanskrit or alien mathematics, or fractal harmonic mathematics. Countless people have attempted to decipher Malcolm Bendel's plasmoid unification model or Marco Rodin's vortex-based maths, wishing to apply these theories to practical projects, only to be frustrated, giving up and sometimes even claiming that they are unintelligible. In this video, I'll prove conclusively that neither theory is unintelligible and provide a method that could easily be adapted to teach the foundations to primary school children, let alone adults. Why should we wish to learn such a thing? I hear some of you ask in the comments, some quite rudely I might add. Here are just a couple of excellent reasons. After watching this video and the second part I'll be releasing next week, you'll know how to reconstruct the entire frequency spectrum of the A432 concert pitch scale uh, using only two operations and starting with the number one, doubling and tripling, and you'll be able to see clearly the harmonic relationships between the notes and the octaves. And having studied six years of music theory in high school, I can tell you that I learned more about the construction of our musical scale from this method in a day than I did from my education. And I'm not picking on my education, it was actually pretty good, I had good teachers, but um, this is just a really good method of understanding. Um, you'll also find out how nearly every single number in the major world scriptures was obtained, um, including the inconceivably long but ultra-specific scale spoken of in the uh, Vedas and Puranas of time and how our compass, clock, and system of time were constructed using the same methods. Um, you'll also learn how the precise and correlating angles and shapes used in the world's architecture, the ancient architecture, were obtained. Um, and again, just starting with the foundation of doubling and tripling. And of course, we'll find the radius and the diameters of the sun, moon, and earth, and the average distances between them, and find precisely the same numbers again. So to be very clear, the reason this is worth considering it's the programming language of the holographic machine, our universe. Why wasn't it taught in school? Uh, the knowledge has been widely hidden and suppressed throughout history. References to it can be found in nearly every country, culture, and religion in the world, hidden in plain sight all throughout history, and I can prove that. And I will over the, in the future videos. It takes a lot of time to put this down, but it's there. In this video, first we will find the forms of the numbers and the operation signs in the Vesica Pisces, and then we'll explore what I hypothesize are the true functions of our numerals and mathematical operation signs by mapping out the numbers on the corresponding sacred geometry using the forms we've discovered as our guides. So let's begin with the forms of the numerals in the Vesica Pisces. And we're going to zoom through this section pretty quickly. Uh, the forms are just the visual representation of the functions. So the explanations will come when we explore the functions afterwards. And you can always pause the video or take a screenshot if you wish to study any particular image further. And I'm also happy to provide these images if anyone wants to use them for anything, just email and ask. For example, you'll see shortly that perceiving the numeral one to function as a mirror plane, as it's shown here, rather than just an arbitrary symbol, opens up a whole new world of possibilities. And here I show the zero, the one, and the family number group three, nine, and six, as well as the infinity eight symbol found in the Vesica Pisces. I show the other family number groups in the square or digital form here. It will again be apparent why I find the symbolism in this form significant, uh, particularly of the family number group two, eight, and five, when we delve into the functions of the forms shortly. Next, we'll briefly go through the forms of the common operation signs found in the Vesica Pisces as well as a couple of extra forms that show us further important mathematical functions. So highlighted here is the vertical mirror plane of the Vesica Pisces. The vertical mirror plane also represents the number one, as we discussed. Next, we have the horizontal mirror plane. This straight horizontal line is variously used as the symbol for subtraction if placed horizontally between two numbers, or for division if placed vertically between two numbers. And if we highlight both the horizontal and vertical mirror planes, the signs for subtraction of one, we obtain the cross, as you see here. If we place our compass point at the intersection of the two planes of the cross and draw the inner circle within the vesica, we obtain the quartered circle, the wheel, or in Latin, the rota. Within the boundaries of the inner circle, we find the symmetrical cross, the addition sign. This cross within a circle has been referred to in older texts as the Latin rota because it acts as a wheel. Its function is that the wheel turns around its axis. 
If the rotor of the addition sign is rotated 45 degrees, it becomes the multiplication sign. The rotor is a wheel within a wheel within a wheel. Next, the triangle. Not a shape that we necessarily associate with our common operation symbols, but nonetheless holding a highly significant place in Pythagorean mathematics. The mirror plane, the cross, and the triangle are the building blocks of harmonic mathematical theory. Of course, as we can obtain the cross from the two mirror planes, we can also mirror our triangle and obtain a diamond or rhombus. This is the first form in which we can see doubling and tripling combined in one cipher. We can do other things with our triangle too, and again, the reason for the significance for these variations on form will become apparent as we explore their correlating functions. Inverting our triangle in a different way, using the six points created by our vesicomyces formed from three circles, we obtain the six-pointed star or hexagram, and this form proves to provide some very enlightening functions indeed. As an easter egg, here's a cipher of the cross-sections of the toroid and the hyperboloidal fields also hidden in the Vesica Pisces, and you'll also, of course, find a symbol quite similar to this in the Alchemical Science Channel logo. I actually discovered this little easter egg um, while I was considering if the secret of the Vesica Pisces is that it's actually composed first of arcs rather than circles. And in this way, uh, we focus on a different aspect of the Vesica. I personally found it quite enlightening to consider things in arcs rather than circles, and it led me to discover many forms that I never noticed in the Vesica before. I humorously remarked to my wife that I'd been going around in circles, focusing on circles. Last Easter egg, before we move on to the functions of the key forms we've discovered. When I decided to draw an arc and an inverted arc together, I ended up with this shape. I don't know if this form already has a name, but I thought the Holy Grail would be quite fitting. Inspired by Malcolm's Vajra thunderstorm theory and the images from Ken Wheeler of the opposing vortexes of the north and south pole of a magnet under the ferrocell, showing that the diverging and converging vortexes actually look quite different, I thought that this wasn't a bad symbolic representation of the opposing centrifugally diverging and centripetally converging vortexes of our field geometry. Probably not exact, but it's a cool little cipher there just to um, explore that form. All right. Now we can see what all of these forms can do for us. So we'll explore the related functions for each of the symbols we've discovered in the Vesica Pisces in turn. First, we have the vertical mirror plane of the one, which we discussed earlier. If we draw our digital five and two on either side of the mirror plane, we'll see that in form, they're simply the inverse of each other. Similarly, their functions are also inverse to each other. The two here represents doubling, and the five on the other side of the mirror plane of one represents 0.5, halving. If we continue the polarized sequence of doubling and halving, we get the following sequences of numbers. If you've been following my vortex-based math series, you'll likely be familiar with these sequences already as the doubling and halving sequences that can be obtained from the Mobius strip of the upper cipher. If we reduce all of these numbers back to their mod 9 roots, as shown using the reduction through addition of the uh, digit equations below the numbers, we obtain the polarized mod 9 doubling and halving sequences of VBM 124875 and 1157842. If we take our initial diagram again, and if we inverse it, so now the five is on the positive or expanding side of the mirror plane of the one, and the two is on the contracting or negative side, we obtain an inverse to the polarized doubling and halving sequence, which I call the fifthing and pentupling sequence. So now we can see that the pentupling sequence is the same numbers as the halving sequence, except that the numbers are now inversely expanded by orders of five, rather than halving in orders of 0.5. And the two has now become 0.2, one fifth of one. And we can again see the doubling sequence that we saw before, except this time inverse as the fifthing sequence. Instead of the doubling whole numbers, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, we now have the fifthing fractional numbers. Oh, uh, sorry, 0.04, 0.008, 0.0016, 0.0018, 0.0019, 0.0019, 0 and point, I should say 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0064. If we reduce these polarized sequences back to mod 9 again, we of course just get the inverse of our polarized Mobius strips. The 124875 is now on the contracting side on the left, and the 157842 is now on the expanding side on the right. 
Let's now take our horizontal mirror plane, the subtraction sign, instead. Our 2 is positioned to the left of the decimal point at the center of the mirror plane of the subtraction sign, showing that, it, uh, that it's the whole number 2. And we can see the doubling sequence laid out to the right, um, starting with 2 minus 1, and then 4 minus 2, and so on. And the 5 is to the right of the decimal point at the center of the mirror plane of the subtraction sign, showing that it represents 0.5, the inverse to 2. We can see the subtraction sequence is inverse to 1 minus 2, 2 minus 4, and so on. If we calculate the results for these subtraction sequences, we shall see that they are inverse 2. So we have the doubling sequence north of the mirror plane, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. And then inversely, the doubling sequence again, but in negative. So minus 1, uh, negative 2, negative 4, negative 8, negative 16, etc. Um, and here we can just see the equations and the results combined. Perfect symmetry. The next functions we are going to explore are those of the cross, the addition and multiplication signs. We find this sign in the quartering of the circle of the vesicle Pisces, the rotor or wheel within a wheel. I learned this method from Pappus's famous treatise on the tarot. If you're inclined to reference the original text, you will find that he uses a different sequence of numbers mapped around the rotor. However, he strongly alludes to hidden operations that he claims were known uh, among the private esoteric circles of the time, and I believe this is very likely one of them. At any rate, let's suffice to say that I've used the 3, 9, and 6 as my base numbers here. So you could also map the numbers 1 to 4 and find many curiosities from that arrangement alone. In this case, we find the 9 placed at the northern point of the cross, the 3 placed at the western point, 3 being one third of 9, the 6 is placed at the southern point, 6 being double 3, and 36 is placed at the eastern point. And 36 is sextuple 6, or 6 times 6, and we could otherwise refer to this as doubling and tripling. And then 9 is again a quarter of 36. Expanding upon our rotor diagram, we can take each point of the first cross and then perform the same operation of the rotor upon it, discovering its harmonic fractal parts in an easy to follow visual form. The rotor is the first way that we can begin to explore the more complex harmonic relationship between numbers other than the simple inverse 2 and 5 sequences we can attain from the mirror plane forms. If we reduce all of these numbers back to their mod 9 counterparts, we'll find primarily 3, 9s and 6s as the numbers are expanded, but also some 2s, 4s, 8s and 1. If we further reduce the numbers back to their theosophic roots, we'll find that all the numbers return to 3, 9, 6 and 1 showing us a different arrangement. And if you haven't seen my previous videos on Theosophic Addition and Subtraction, it's simply the process of finding the ultimate root of any number. First, by adding together the digits of any multiple digit number until you get a single digit mod nine root number. So for example, the mod nine root of 35 would be three plus five equals eight, so eight. And then to find the Theosophic root of the single digit mod nine number, uh, you take its parts and you add them together again. So for example, 8 equals 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8. So it equals 36. 36 equals 3 plus 6 equals 9. So the theosophic root of 8 is 9. In this way, all numbers can be reduced back to their absolute harmonic roots of 1, 3, 9, or 6. Next we have the triangle, or what Pappus referred to as the ternary or trinity, Latin for composed of three items. We again arrange our 3, 9, and 6, this time within the ternary. We see that the 3 is a third of 9, the 6 is double 3, and then the 9 is again the 6 uh, tripled and then halved. In other words, the 6 is two thirds of 9. If we triangulate our numbers back to their theosophic or mod 9 roots, in this case using additional multiplication as shown in this image, we'll find we always obtain 6, 9, or 3. And now if we inverse the triangle below the horizontal mirror plane, we can use this new cipher of the rhombus to show both doubling and triangulation, or thirding and two-thirding together. We can see that if we do our reduction to mod 9 operations again using addition and multiplication, whether we double or halve, we obtain the inverse results of 3, 9 and 6 again. Another good way to show how these sequences can expand is this cipher which I've referred to as the trinity here three triangles with an inverse triangle formed at its center. In this way, we can expand the three and the six. We see that by triangulating six, we get two and four, 
2 plus 4 equals 6, and then 4 times 6 equals 24. 24 is in octave resonance with 6, two octaves higher. 2 and 4 are fractal parts of both 24 and 6. If we triangulate 3, we get 1 and 2. 1 plus 2 equals 3. 1 and 2 is also 12, 4 times 3. We can do the same operation in reverse by instead mirroring the halving sequence in the inverse triangle. Using the same reduction operations, we will obtain the same root numbers regardless. And we can see the true fundamental arrangement of the root numbers more clearly in this cipher, applied to either the doubled or halved mirrored triangle, so reducing them to their theosophic roots. And now we come to the last simple function that I wanted to show, um, that of the septenary hexagram or six-pointed star. So termed the septenary by Pappus due to the seventh number in the center of the hexagon, which here in my diagrams represents the result of all of the outer numbers of the star added together. And here I show the sequence expanded further. We see that there are two separate sequences used here, uh, one beginning with the nine and it's double 18, and the other sequence beginning with the 3 and it's double 6. In Pappas's treatise, he demonstrates simply using the numbers 1 to 7, but again he alludes that this is not the most important sequence that can be found as a function of the ternary. So where can we go next to further explore and understand the form and function of our fractal uh, harmonic numbers, particularly in their expanded forms? I suggest that we look next to the chessboard, and I've done an initial video on this theory already, but that's just the first part of the chess series. Um, it's only the initial formation of the theory, and I've since made a lot of major updates, corrections, and revisions. In the next part on that series of the chessboard, I'll show how and why I placed the inverse pentoppling sequence in the previously empty columns between the horizontal tripling uh, sequence columns. And you may already be able to see it in this image, uh, but I'll also show you how the entire spectrum of musical frequencies in A432 can be obtained from the chessboard, um, or the most harmonic chart of numbers, and we speak about the underrated importance of intervals and ratios. As promised, we'll also show how the movement of the chess pieces, and those of the ancient Vedic origin game to chess, Chaturanga, can be used to help us demonstrate and learn the most important harmonic relations between the numbers. The knowledge we learned in this video can also be applied directly to understanding the fundamentals of vortex-based maths. And if you're interested in Marco Roden's work, I've linked to both my videos on vortex-based math and Marco's Tesla Tech presentations in the description. And if you're unfamiliar with VBM completely and you want to know more, I suggest starting with my Abha Cypher video and then following the rest of my series on VBM from there. I have a fourth and fifth part for that series already nearly ready to film. I'm just finishing scripting them. So this plenty to catch up on in the meantime for VBM. And also, as many of you are probably following the channel for, um, you can most certainly use this knowledge to begin to understand Malcolm Bendel's iconic plasmoid unification model, in which he shows the numbers for and the conversions between time, the resonant frequencies and phase change points of the elements, sound, the compass, the zodiac, the planets, and more. The first three parts of my series on the PUM are already out and I'll be working on releasing the fourth. So keep an eye out for all of those new videos coming, and like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and if you'd like to help me stay open source and independent in my research, please consider donating to the channel with the link in the description. We make every dollar go quite a long way around here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.